Now that we've seen how to modify device trees, let's take a look at adding driver modules to our kernel so that we can enable Wi-Fi on our board. The DK1 version of the board does not have the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth module populated, so we must add our own. You're welcome to use Ethernet, but that honestly seems to just work out of the box. I wanted a little more of a challenge, so I'm going to show you how to get this Wi-Fi USB dongle to work on our system. Wi-Fi and Linux have had a complicated history. What I'm going to show you took a lot of trial and error, along with some help from my DigiKey friend Robert Nelson, to figure out which driver worked well for this particular Wi-Fi module. Expect to spend some time trying different dongles, firmware, and kernel modules to find one that works for your particular board and Linux build. The first thing we want to do is look up our chipset. This Linux Wireless LAN support page has some good information and tools for you. So what I recommend doing is selecting USB from this list, saying show because we're using a USB Wi-Fi dongle. If you're using SPI or PCI or something else, you'll want to select a different interface. There are a lot of products listed here, so I recommend searching. My particular Wi-Fi dongle is the TP-Link TLWN725N, so we'll search for that. You see it's listed here, and this is the chipset that we care about, the Realtek RTL8188EU. There's a link to the driver if you want to download the source code directly or the binary directly if it's not open source. And it has a yellow, which means that it might work with Linux. Any of these yellow ones you're going to probably be in for a struggle getting it to work with Linux. I did find that this one, I could get it working, but I had another Eddie Max with an RTL8192CU that I could not get working. So it's really kind of up in the air whether the kernel is going to support it, if there's firmware, if there's drivers for it. It can take you some time just trying different combinations of things to see if you can get your particular chipset working and supported in your image. With that in mind, let's head back to our host machine. And we're going to go into our Yocto directory. As we've done before, we're going to enable our build environment using the source command, and that's going to put us in the build-mp1 directory. We can search for variables and other strings using bitbake-e, and in this case we're going to grab or search for virtual kernel. In this case, you'll notice that the virtual kernel is linux-stm32mp. That is the name of our kernel that we will be compiling. The very first time you ran bitbake to build this entire image, it created a .config file with all of the kernel settings. If you're curious, I recommend looking for that file, and it's going to be in the temp work folder somewhere because it was downloaded or generated saved in there, and then used to configure the kernel during the bitbake building process. As you can see, a number of things rely on this .config file. It's obviously different .config files for each thing. For example, uBoot has its own .config file that gets downloaded and configured during the build process. What we care about is this .config file right here. Temp, work, the name of our machine, what we're building with, the name of that kernel that we saw earlier, Linux-STM32MP, should match the virtual kernel we saw up here, the kernel version, build, and that's where the .config file sits. You do not want to modify this file directly. Bitbake will likely yell at you if you do. Instead, we can make temporary changes for this particular build by calling bitbake-c menu config if I can spell menu config correctly, and then virtual kernel. That will take a moment to fire up Bitbake, parse through some of our configuration settings, and then present us with a new screen that allows us to make changes in the kernel configuration. We saw this process when we made changes to BusyBox, but this time we're going to be doing it to the kernel where we're going to enable some drivers and other modules. Note that it brings up a whole new window here, 
which I will make a little bigger for us. If you're doing everything over SSH, you will need to install the screen tool so that you can have this menu config GUI work in an SSH terminal. If you're working with the DK2 version of the board, ST gives you this nice guide that shows you how to enable the drivers to support the onboard chip. And these are the features that you need to enable in that screen that we just brought up. However, we're working with the DK1, which means I'm using a USB Wi-Fi dongle, and these won't necessarily work, but this is a good starting place. Let's head back to our kernel configuration screen. The first thing I want to do is scroll down and find networking support, which is right here above device drivers. Then I want to go into networking options, and I want to make sure that TCP IP is enabled because we need that to communicate with almost anything on the internet. Unless, of course, you're using UDP. Specifically in here, we want IP kernel level auto configuration, DHCP, boot P, and RARP or RARP. I also recommend finding the IPv6 protocol and making sure that's enabled. I don't think that's needed for my particular network, but you might need it depending on what kind of network you have. It looks like everything is enabled, so I will X out of this screen. Some of these are enabled by default, but I recommend checking just to make sure. Still under networking support, I want to go down and find wireless. Press enter to go into there. Make sure this CFG802.11 wireless configuration API is selected. The defaults here should be okay. You'll also want CFG802.11 wireless extensions compatibility. This works with some older chipsets. If I remember, this works as a layer that allows a driver to communicate with the hardware. I might be incorrect on that, but we do need wireless extensions or WEXT in order to get some of this working where we're talking to a USB Wi-Fi dongle, especially older ones. Make sure that the generic IEEE 802.11 networking stack is selected, and you'll also want Minstrel. If I remember, this is for rate control in 802.11. You'll probably need it, and it's on by default anyway. Once we're done with that, select Exit. Exit out of networking support, and now we go into device drivers. Here, you will want to find network device support, which is right here that I just passed up, and you will look for wireless LAN. And a lot of this is really trial and error and reading things online about what needs to be enabled, trying different settings, and seeing if you can talk to your USB Wi-Fi dongle and getting that to connect to your network. Once in there, we're looking for the Realtek devices, the RTL family. So I'm going to hit page down a couple of times to get to the R's. And this is the only page that I have found that is in alphabetical order, which makes it a little easier to navigate. I'm sure there are a few others, but most of these configuration settings are just kind of random and not in any sort of alphabetical order, which makes it hard to find stuff. You can search by hitting slash, just like you would in VI, and that does help you try to locate some things. In the Realtek devices, I recommend turning off this Realtek RTL Wi-Fi family of devices. This does support some RTL devices by default, but we don't want it to conflict with the staging driver that we're about to enable. So I'm gonna press spacebar to get rid of that M so that this particular driver or driver set is not installed. I also want to make sure that none of these other drivers are installed as that's about to conflict with what we're going to install. If you remember the days from early Raspberry Pi or BeagleBone Black, you had conflicting drivers for some of the USB dongles and you had to blacklist them. So we're going to avoid that by just installing the one driver that we need. We're done with these drivers, so let's exit out of this. Let's exit out of network device support. And we're gonna look for USB support. So I'm gonna continue scrolling down. I'm gonna look for support for host side USB. 
make sure that this is on. That makes sure that I can communicate to USB devices that are plugged into my USB ports. So my USB ports are acting as a host. The other thing we need is enable USB persist by default. I think that just means USB stays up and doesn't turn off. I'm not super sure on this particular option, but I believe we want it to be up because during times of Wi-Fi communication, you don't want it to drop the connection if there's not a lot of activity going on. Still in device drivers, now we're looking for the staging drivers. Here they are. So you'll want to press spacebar to enable them, press enter to go into them. These are drivers that are staged, which means that the kernel tentatively supports them for right now. They should be included in the kernel in later releases. So come, I don't know, kernel version 5.20, you might see these included and they won't be under staging any longer. They'll probably be in that RTL Realtek section that we looked at earlier. So what we need is this RTL 8188EU driver that wasn't included in the kernel, but it's kind of in this experimental staging testing phase. If you're working with a future version of the kernel, this particular driver may not be here. It might be in that other Realtek section. So pay attention to that when you're enabling some of these drivers. I'll push space to make sure that this driver gets loaded as a module. We can enable access point mode for our device. I don't need it, so I'm going to deselect it. However, access point mode might be very useful for what you're working on. For example, if you want to broadcast an access point that people log into with, say, their cell phone, so that they are presented with a web page that they fill out their own network details, and then your device drops access point mode and then connects as a client to another network. That's a pretty common way to allow users to select which Wi-Fi network a device should connect to. But since we don't need access point now, I know the name of the network, the password, and we're just going to enter that in the Linux console once we boot up this device. From there, let's exit out of staging drivers. We'll exit out of device drivers. And next we're looking for enable loadable module support, which is right here. Press enter to go in there. We're looking for module signature verification, which is this one, press space. That's going to give me a few new options. I'm gonna push space to require modules to be validly signed and automatically sign all modules. We have to pick which algorithm we want to sign our modules with, and I'm gonna pick SHA-256 because SHA-1 is pretty insecure if I remember. You could do 512, I'm sure. What I have found is that while we're building this new image, it's going to want to include the region database for selecting what region our Wi-Fi network should operate on. In my case, it's the US. This particular database file, it's a fairly small file, these days only comes signed, which means we have to enable signing support in our modules. That way our driver can pick up this database or load it read the country code and use that information in order to attach itself to my particular network. And I have found that the only way to get this to work is by enabling signature verification for the modules. When we're done, select exit, exit out of the top level menu. You'll be asked to save the new configuration and say yes. If you remember from earlier, these configuration settings are saved in this .config file that's in our temp work machine kernel whatever version driver location. We can print that out and look for these individual settings. In this case, I'm going to look for RTL, which should give me an idea of what things are set. For example, it looks like RTL 8152 is still set. Feel free to go back into that menu and disable that, but that shouldn't conflict with our RTL 8188. If you'll notice, there is no 8188 listed here, and that is because it is a different name for whatever bizarre reason. It's known as R8188. 
So we look for that and sure enough, M means it is set and it's set as a module to be included. There is something else you should be aware of and that is the original configuration settings are saved in config.orig. Here we have the original settings and old is the last update that I did. So .config is the most recent, .config.old is the previous settings, .config.orig is the original prior to me messing around with that menu config. If we grep for this R8188 in the original, you can see that it is not set. If we use the original, the driver will not be included in our kernel. At this point, we can bit bake our image and it would include these changes from this .config file, just like we set. However, it only works for this particular build. If we want to make it a more permanent change, the best way to do that is to save this .config as a default configuration file, which I'll show you how to do in a second, and then include it in our custom layer. So then when we deploy or download or somebody copies or clones our custom layer, these kernel settings come with it. I recommend finding out which kernel settings work by playing around with this virtual kernel setting and the menu config, building, testing, and then when you're ready, then we can save it as a default configuration file and include it in our layer. To do that, we're gonna call bitbake-c, save def config for default config, and name the virtual kernel the thing that we just updated. When it's done, what you'll find is that there is now a def config file that is located in the same directory as those .config files we were just looking at. That's the file that we care about, and we're gonna save that to our custom layer. If you remember from a previous episode, we created a recipes kernel Linux folder structure in our meta custom layer, and we used that to patch the device tree file. That allowed us to enable the I squared C port for our particular board. We're going to add another file, that def config we just created, in this collection of files as part of this recipe collection. And we're going to update this .bb append so that that default configuration file becomes the new configuration for our kernel. Let's go back to the top directory of this custom layer. One thing I forgot to do in that Linux directory is make a new directory called files. Now you could keep this default configuration file wherever you want and use the .bb append recipe to pull it in from somewhere on your computer, ideally somewhere in that layer. But in this case, we're gonna keep it in Linux and a new files directory. We're going to copy in that default configuration file that we just created, and we're gonna put it in that new files directory, which is in recipe kernel, recipes kernel, Linux and files, and you want to call it def config. The naming of this file is super important. There are potential ways to change the name of this file, but the way I'm gonna show you how to include this file in that recipe, the name def config is super important. So keep it def config. You're welcome to take a look at this file and it just looks like a series of configuration settings. That's all it is. It's just a lot of them because it basically defines what's being included in our kernel and what modules should be downloaded, loaded, and installed during the bitbake process. Make sure to not save and get out of this. Then we're going to edit that .bb append recipe. These two lines should be in here from the last time we made this recipe. The first thing we wanna do is edit this file extra paths search location. This tells Bitbake where to look for particular files. The delimiter between locations is a colon, so after this colon, let's add our new location. I for insert. This deer tells it to search relative to wherever this recipe is found, and we're gonna tell it to search in that files directory that we just made. Add another colon here so that it acts as a delimiter for whatever gets appended after this. 
Ideally, this prepend means that these search locations come first when Bitbake is going through and looking for files or looking for folders in order to search for files. I'm going to go to the end of this last line, press A to append, push enter, enter, where I'm going to create a little note that says apply the default configuration, and we're going to assign this kernel def config variable. Note, once again, the naming is very important. It needs to be kernel def config underscore your machine name. That is the machine name that we set in the build directory conf local.conf. So go back and look at that file if you need help remembering what the name of the machine was. For our case, it's stm32mp1. And then we're going to tell it the name of that def config file. I tried different names here. I tried custom underscore def config, my def config, none of that worked. There is something that's going on inside of Bitbake that I'm not honestly quite sure about, but the name of def config file is important here. Don't change the name of that file. Press escape to go to command mode and then colon WQ to save and exit or write quit, I suppose. Now that we've told the kernel that we want to build a few things with it, we do have to do another step that involves telling the image which modules and firmware to load, which includes some of those kernel modules. So go into recipes core, images, custom image .bb recipe. This is the recipe we created for our image. If you remember us doing this, I believe this was the first episode or second episode in the series, the first one where we talk about creating your own layer. Go to the end, let's add a section for telling the image which modules we want to install for the USB Wi-Fi drivers. We'll use this image install variable again, and we're going to use plus equals in order to append items to it, just like the line above it where you see image install plus equals get temp. This will just append more things to that variable. We're going to have it include the module R8188EU. Remember, this is not RTL8188. We can do a new line with the backslash. In addition to the kernel module, which works as our driver, we also need a firmware. I think this gets loaded onto the USB device itself. I'm not entirely sure, but I did find this is necessary to get everything working. In this case, it's not R8188, it's RTL8188. That took a bunch of trial and error to figure out the exact name of the firmware that I needed to include in this. You're welcome to statically assign an IP address, but since my network works with DHCP, I'm going to include the DHCP client on the image so that I can use that tool to get an address automatically from my router. There used to be a suite of tools known as wireless tools that you can install. I think that was the name of the collection. However, in our case, this newer version of Yocto, it is not called wireless tools. It is called just IW, or more specifically, this is just the IW tool that allows us to work with the wireless interface. Most modern Wi-Fi networks rely on a security standard known as Wi-Fi Protected Access, or WPA. There's a Linux tool known as WPA Supplicant that does key negotiation between my device and the router to make sure that the communication is secure. That runs in the software level, so we need to include that tool here. Finally, there is the regulatory database static file that you can include. That gets loaded in by the driver to make sure you're operating within your regulation space. For me, it's the United States. I found that I needed to have this. You're welcome to try getting wireless working without this wireless reg DB static being installed. Even though we're installing the driver, it will not get loaded on boot automatically. So we have to tell the kernel that we want to load it automatically. If you don't do this step, what you'll have to do is when you boot into the device, you'll have to do something like mod probe and then the name of the driver so that the module itself gets loaded and you can then use it to communicate with your Wi-Fi dongle. But let's just put it here so that whenever we plug in the USB Wi-Fi dongle, this module gets loaded or it's rather loaded at boot and ready to go so that when we plug in the dongle, we can communicate with it directly without having to call mod probe. When we're done with this, hit escape, do colon WQ, 
And we are going to go out and back into our build directory. And we are ready to call bitbake custom image. This will take some time. This takes an hour, hour and a half for me because it has to include and recompile sections or all of the kernel that's going to be in our image. So I'm gonna take a break and come back when this is done. Our build process is done, and before we flash it to an SD card, I recommend checking the manifest file. And we can do that by going into our deploy directory and looking at, we don't want core image minimal, we actually want our custom image, and there should be a manifest file that shows what we installed. And this is the manifest file for our current image. We can grep for RTL. In this case, we should see that the firmware for RTL 8188 is going to be installed. That's a plus. That means our settings worked. Just like we've done before, we need to copy the root file system as well as the boot file system since we made changes to the kernel. Let's unmount both of these partitions. We'll start with the boot file system partition. And that will take uh, a few seconds to a minute to copy. I think it's 64 megabytes over. Yep. Then we'll copy the root file system over to the fifth partition of our SD card, just like we've done in previous episodes. This will take a minute or two, because if you remember, we expanded the root file system to take up 200 megabytes instead of the normal, what was it, 8 or 10 megabytes. When that's done, if you remember, we need to make a change to something on the boot file system, so unplug your SD card and plug it back in. It should auto mount for us. You'll see it down here in my Mint Linux, or Linux Mint, I suppose. And we'll want to change this extlinux.conf file that's in the mmc underscore extlinux directory of the boot file system. We need to change this root variable or argument here. I'm going to change it to mmc block zero partition five escape and colon wq for write and quit. Once that's done, I'm going to unmount both of my drives. And there are a couple of ways to do this. You can do it through the GUI or you can do it to the command line with the umount command. And note that by calling umount, and I believe doing it through the GUI, it should automatically call a sync prior to unmounting the drive to make sure any unwritten changes that are buffered are written to the partition prior to unmounting it. You run the risk of potentially corrupting something if you just try to remove the device without unmounting or syncing. And we need to do the same to the root file system. And once we're done with that, we can unplug the SD card and plug it into our board. We'll open up a serial terminal to the board and we'll give power to the board. Hopefully we'll see everything booting up just like we've done before. Hopefully you'll see some new drivers being loaded some of the modules, the CFG 802.11, lib 802.11, I saw one for the USB port, the RTL device. One thing I noticed since I enabled all of these new drivers and modules, it now takes longer to give me a login prompt. That is something I have not chased down yet. I'm not entirely sure why that's happening. It used to give me a login prompt right after about this 10 second mark. And then after I logged in or while waiting, it would give me this 33 second D message output about the voltages. But if you see here, it now takes an extra 20 or 30 seconds to give me a login prompt. It might be trying to look for something on the network. I haven't chased this down yet, but if I wanted to make booting as fast as possible, that's something I would have to chase down. But for now, it works. It gives me a login prompt. We'll log in with root and tor. If you installed modules, you should see a modules directory in lib. We'll go to the kernel version, kernel drivers, network, or net. Sometimes you'll see the drivers appear in the network if you enabled certain network drivers. Since we enabled the staging driver for the RTL 8188, that's where this driver is located. 
and there is our driver, our kernel module for the Realtek RTL8188EU. We don't need that, so I'm going to hit Control u to delete that line. And with any luck, we should see the device in our if config. However, it's not enabled. So we can look at if config a to look at all of the devices. There's WLAN. Okay, that's a plus. We can bring up the address with if config WLAN up and then check if config again and WLAN 0 should appear there. That's good. And WLAN 0 or WLAN, this might be different for you depending on the kernel modules, the drivers, the firmware, and maybe the device itself. But for me, it is WLAN for wireless LAN 0. Sometimes this works. IWWLAN0 scan will allow you to scan the available networks. It did work for me on the older device that I was trying, on the older USB Wi-Fi dongle. However, it's not working with this one. Once again, something I have not tracked down, but it still looks like this dongle is working. This would give you an output, or it should give you an output, of all of the available networks that you can connect to. That might have to do with the fact that it's a staging driver. I don't know. It's something I haven't tracked down yet. In order to connect to a Wi-Fi network running the WPA or WPA2 security protocol, we need to use this WPA supplicant file as well as the background process. The configuration file looks like this. We need to add our own network here that contains the SSID of the network as well as the password. You are welcome to use the password in plain text, but once again, that's probably not a good idea. So to avoid that, we can use this WPA passphrase tool, and that's going to create a hash, I'm not exactly sure what kind of hash, of the password and store it in this WPA supplicant file. And that way at least your password's not stored in plain text. You'll want to put in quotes the SSID and your password, and you're going to append that to the end of this WPA supplicant file. Obviously, make sure that my SSID and my password are your particular SSID and password for your network. Something you'll want to do is actually come down to where this network information was placed. You'll see the my SSID and you'll see the my password stored as the PSK, the pre-shared key, but it's commented out. So once again, your password is stored as plain text, which is not great. But this hash over here, or whatever encrypted version of your password that's here, I'm sure one of you knows what encryption scheme is used to hash your password here. I don't remember. But what I recommend doing is deleting the line with your password on it so that it's not stored in plain text on your machine. And then we can colon WQ to write and quit. I'm going to update WPA Supplicant with my personal SSID and password, but since I don't want to show that to YouTube and to the world, I'm going to clear the console now, and I'm going to update that file with my SSID and password, and then come back and show you how to connect to a network. I'm back and I've updated the WPA supplicant file with my personal SSID and password, so I can connect to my network. And now we are going to run the WPA supplicant tool. We're going to do that in the background with this dash B. We're going to do it with the WLAN 0 interface. We're going to use the WEXT driver. This is the wireless extensions driver that we installed as a module when we were picking kernel modules. And we're going to tell it to use the WPA supplicant configuration file. Hit enter again because sometimes you lose the command prompt in some of these messages. Hopefully you should see WPA supplicant being initialized. You should see association success with our device. And something about the link becoming ready. I have not chased down why this operation is not permitted, why RF kill can't get this WIFI information. To be honest, I'm not super sure what WIFI is. It's something I will have to track down in the future. But we can do RF kill list. Okay, so RF kill, it looks like, is not picking up this USB Wi-Fi driver or dongle. Usually you can use RF kill to control some of the aspects of the wireless adapters. In this case, RF kill can't control it, which is probably given by the reason it's not able to communicate with the device or get this information that it's looking for.
If you happen to know why RFKill isn't working to pick up my Wi-Fi dongle here, please leave a comment, I would love to know. Once again, IW does not seem to be working as a tool for me with this particular dongle. It did work on my last dongle. You should be able to call IW Dev WLAN 0 link, and that should give you information about the access point that you have connected to. But once again, IW isn't working for whatever reason. It's something I have not tracked down yet, but the dongle does seem to be working. Assuming everything is working, we can call DH client and our interface. Give it a second. Hopefully it works. We can look at if config again, and sure enough, I've got an IP address that's been assigned to me by my router. That means we are connected. And at this point, you should have all of your good Linux tools available, or at least whichever ones came in BusyBox, that you can test your network connection with. Here I'm pinging 8.8.8.8, .8 which is one of my favorite things to test internet connection. And we can actually fetch a web page using wget. And this dash here means print it to the console rather than saving it to a file. And here is example.com. All of the glorious HTML, example domain, this domain is for use in illustrative examples in documents, or, you know, pulling down on a newly minted embedded Linux device. I hope this shows you how you can go through the process of finding and loading a driver to get your specific Linux build to connect to a network so that you can start developing, say, IoT applications, whether they're headless devices or something that has some kind of user interface. As I mentioned previously, this is a really horrible way to have a user connect to a network. You probably need to think about the user experience here if you're developing a consumer electronics device. Maybe it's a phone app that they connect using Bluetooth, then they give it the SSID and password credentials, or maybe it comes up as an access point and you're presented with some type of portal web page where you enter the credentials for your network, the device then resets its own interface and then connects to the provided network. Just some things to think about as you're developing your devices. I'm going to have to end the series here for now. I know there are a lot of things that we did not cover, but I hope you got a sense of how you might go about creating a custom Linux image for your particular board and application. Good luck and happy hacking.